Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group Weekly Roundup. This is for the coming uh, trading week ending September 20th, 2024. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. Well, the theme this week is clearly the feds are all in. And let's just kind of go through what we saw this past week and where I think the markets could be headed over the next uh, couple of months, or at least through the end of the year anyway. So if we look at the performance here, Everybody was solidly in the green weekly and year to date. I mean, the market moved to record highs as just about all investors celebrated the kickoff to what most think are going to be a prolonged Fed rate cutting cycle. All right. The rally this week was or this past week was relatively broad. Smaller cap index is outperforming um, and the event kind of dominating the entire investor sentiment this week was the Fed's rate announcement where they cut rates um, much bigger than, well, I guess the markets were expecting it. 50 basis points, that's the first, first rate cut really since March of 2020. Um, so the first day they cut it on Wednesday, it was relatively muted, um, you know, kind of taking the Fed funds rate from four uh, down from the current rate down to 4.75 to 5%. All right. Well, the index actually ended the day in the red. However, uh, everybody celebrated the next day on Thursday with markets up very strong. Uh, and we saw the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ all surging to new record highs. Keep in mind, over the past 20 years, the Feds have only gone more than 25 basis points. That's a quarter percent. Just 12 times. And all those times were centered around either the 08, 09 financial crisis here in the U.S. or during the COVID pandemic. To me, this 50 bip rate cut read more fear in their words, and they're way behind the um, game plan rather than what they were saying is everything is fine. I mean, many analysts now are saying that the forward projection of the S&P for the next decade, 10 to 20 years, is only going to average around 8%. Okay, um, And this year right now, as you can see, we're up year to date over 19%, both for the S&P, NASDAQ, Dow's up over 11, Russell uh, close to 10%, okay? Um, you can see this past week's economic data also had an upbeat overall tone to it. We saw retail sales rising 10 basis points, which was more than expected, the consumer still hanging in there. And they also revised up July's retail sales by 1.1%. So that just kind of tells me consumers still are in good shape right now. All right. So that helped. And then we got continuing claims in the jobs numbers. They came in at the lowest level in three months of this past Thursday. In addition, uh, that troubled housing sector, we got their data on Wednesday as well. B building permits rose 4.9% in August. That's the um, biggest monthly gain we've seen in real estate going back to last March. So, we did get some economic data that was positive, and then you toss in that large 50 bip rate cut, then the markets just really wanted to rally higher, right? And we saw the yield on the benchmark 10-year note uh, rose just a little bit, not dramatically in the wake of the Fed rate cut decision, but it's at the highest intraday level it's been in since last, uh, or since um, just a few weeks ago, okay? Not too far ago. Keep in mind the average, um, Fed fund rate is 4.6% going back to 1954, but the current dot plot suggests 50 more uh, rate, 50 basis point more rate cut uh, in the next two meetings. Remember, we do not have a meeting in October. We got one in November and one in December. And then there's a projection of 100 basis point rate cuts in 2025. So ending 2025, at uh, three and a quarter to three and a half percent. That's what the feds are saying right now. Okay. So it'll be real interesting to see how all of this stuff shakes out uh, and where everything plays out. You can see the PE ratio, even though the forward projection is, is a little bit less than the trailing 12 month. It, to me, it's still too rich over 23. That's just too rich. I don't see how the earnings are going to come through. To support that, it's multiple expansion, but we will see soon enough. We got earnings kicking off in about three weeks. We'll see where they're going and where the rate adjustments are going to be based on the earnings guidance. You can see the earnings yields at 4.62%.
Current VIX was down just slightly for the week to finish off at 16.15. And then the best performer for the week was energy, up 3.7. Worst performer for the week was real estate, <clears throat> surprisingly, uh, down 1.17%. Now, year to date, I guess you could say surprisingly as well, utilities are leading the way 28.52%. Utilities is typically a risk off sector, more or less a bond proxy uh, in the equity world, but it is just up and you could thank AI and the growing needs of power consumption for that move higher with utilities. Energy is bringing up the rear, but still in the green, 7.58%. Um, and then, of course, if we take a look at Europe and see what's happening over there, Mostly in the green, except for the FTSE, it was down about a half a percent uh, on the week. Year to date, everybody's in the green again, except for the CAC 40. It's down about a half a percent, but everybody's just barely above in the green um, over in Europe. The Bank of England, as expected, they did not cut their rates. Their current rate is at 5%. Um, and it was an eight to one vote for no change. And then their governor, Andrew Bailey, stressed it's, you know, pretty much they want to keep inflation low. So they need to be careful not to cut too fast or by too much. So we got that out of the UK. And meanwhile, across the Eurozone, the ECB policymakers indicated that further easing in their monetary policy should be gradual. So they're they're given that same approach, a little bit gradual, slow approach. Uh, because they're still fearful of inflation over there as well. Meanwhile, on the Eurozone uh, economic front, hourly wages and salaries grew at an annual rate of 4.5% in the three months through June. And that's down just slightly from 5.2% uh, in the first three months uh, or the prior quarter. So that's kind of what we're getting there. And then, of course, if we go over the Asian markets, you can see over here in Japan, the Nikkei it was up a little over 3% for the week, double digits for year to date. A little over 12 percent. They had their meeting. Remember, at the same time as ours, 19 and 20, the Bank of Japan, they did not cut their short term interest rates or they left their. I'm sorry, they didn't raise them. They left them at 25 basis points. Um, it was, most people thought they would leave it alone, but there were a few that thought they would raise the rates, but they didn't. The Bank of Japan has raised their rates twice in 2024. One of the times surprised the markets. That was that big August 5th crash that we had with the market just moving down and VIX volatility just went through the roof. Um, but right now on the domestic front, uh, Japan's core CPI, it rose 2.8% uh, in August. That's kind of in line with expectations. It was up 27 from July. And the overall CPI rose 3%, also matching consensus. That was from the prior months, 2.8. So inflation is still, uh, neutral to slightly higher so that may spur them in the next meeting to cut the um, or to raise the rates again in japan um, again you guys know i'll show you the chart in a minute i love the japanese yen just a really good trade meanwhile if we look at the uh, chinese market you can see the hang sen up very strong week year to date it's over seven percent but china continues to struggle while they were in the green this week as you can see year to date they're down eight percent okay they had, um, it was a holiday shortened week for them, um, and the data uh, was very disappointing, all the economic data coming out of China, very disappointing. They're slowing momentum in their economy. I mean, industrial production only rose 4.5%. That's lagging forecast. It was down from 5.1% in July. They have weaker commodity prices. Auto sales are weak. Retail sales came in a below consensus 2.1%, all right? That's slow. Um, and fixed asset investment rose also lower than expected uh, also in the first half of this year. So they're having issues there. Taking together, all these indicators suggest that there's growing risk for Beijing in meeting its economic growth target this year of 5%. In fact, some of the U.S. analysts are reducing their growth this year to 4.7, 4.8%. OK, and we want to follow them, even though we may not invest in China or maybe some of the ETFs there. They're the second largest economy on the planet. And Germany is starting to feel the impact of it with their auto sales, because a lot of their exports from Mercedes and Audi and some of their other cars, Beamers, they go over to uh, China and they're not buying them as much. So the consumer is clearly hurting there and that backs up and that starts to affect Europe and that'll start to affect us as well. 
One bit of good news is they export deflationary types of uh, 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 impact on the European and the U.S. markets as they're just having a heck of a time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shift the screen over here. Let me just get you over to the S&P 500 E-mini futures. And let's take a look at it here. It'll take a couple of seconds to come up on the screen. But what you're going to see here uh, is a daily chart of the S&P E-mini futures. You can see my target here. It's a little bit faster than my target. My target was somewhere in early November. It would come up to around 58.50. We almost hit it. We came in at 57.97 uh, right here. Uh, and you can see this gap right here, which I suspect is going to be filled. Um, I, I do see a little bit of a, a softening in price here. But this was just a, a, a gap that's just begging to be um, closed off here, right in that area right there, right? So let me just take this off the screen here like that. Um, so I can see that coming back down there. Uh, and and the, the I do not see us going below the 53.94, which is a pretty good little haul from where we've been. I do see us pulling back about 100 points or so um, over the next um, four to six weeks. Keep in mind, we will be getting earnings in about three weeks. We're going to start kicking off earnings three to four weeks. Um, and I just think we're going to see some downward revisions in earnings per share growth. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. And that'll move the markets down just a little bit. But I do not think we're going to hit the lows that we made in early um, August down here. I just I don't see us doing that. OK, um, I do see a possible retest of the 50 EMA, but I did have my target up here. and We're right close to my target. So this is where the the um, uh, uh, potential. Um, Support points are going to come in, and if I just let my system do a calculation here on a possible um, uh, Elliott Wave 4 down, it's showing you right down here to 56.58, down to about 54.50, right? So 56.50, 54.50, somewhere in that area there over the next six weeks or so. That, to me, seems like a, uh, a probable move as the markets digest this big move higher, right? Um, if we come in and we look at the um, FANG index, one interesting note here with these big moves that we've been seeing, the FANG index is not making new highs, all right? I mean, it's not. It's, it's you know, clearly moving up, but it's not at the new highs. And if we look at, let me just go back real quick to the S&P 500. You can see here it made new highs on um, uh, September the 19th, right, on uh, right after the um, – the feds uh, came out at or the Thursday made new highs and then just kind of running sideways here. So we got new highs in the S&P. And if we look at the um, uh, SPX equal weight, it also made new highs. Right. So if we look at the equal weight, you can see the new highs were made on the uh, 19th. Right. Up 12.74 percent. So this is the S&P equal weight. That tells me money's rotating out of some of the big mega cap tech and into other stocks, which is a good thing. But you're seeing here a possible setup for a divergence, which does success, suggest over the next four to six weeks, we should see some softening in price. All right. Um, if we come down here and look at the Russell, the Russell is uh, at a very strong week. All right. The Russell was up a little over two percent for the week. But you can see here how the Russell is nearing its highs for the year. Now, the last all time of the uh, the high for for uh, the Russell was on July 31st and then we had that big sell off in early August and now it's just reclaiming that um, but it's lagging behind even though it's had a strong week you know stronger than the other indexes uh, it still had made new uh, highs here all right and then of course if we come in and we look at the Dow Dow also made new highs um, also on Thursday right the 19th so we made new highs here intraday it was up to 12.15 percent so all in all some really strong uh, market moves here all right i mean really strong if we come down here <coughs> and look at volatility if we look at the vix you can see here on this daily chart we are in the yellow zone so there's still a a, a reason to be cautious here uh with the vix if we look at the uh, front month skew um let me just look at the back month skew here. Let's look at that for a second. Uh, all right, I'm not getting the data here this week, so we'll we'll look at that a little bit later. 
Um, let me just see if I can get. No, I'm getting all these. It's not. It's not working for me this weekend. We'll come back to it next week. If we look at the bond market, <coughs> bond market's pulling back a little bit, which means interest rates are moving a little bit higher. They started moving higher on the 17th of September, leading into the Fed move. Even though the Feds are cutting the rates, remember the bond market is further out in time. It's not as affected by interest rate cuts by the Fed. The two-year is affected. The front end of the curve is affected. The back end, interest rates are going up just a little bit. Okay, so that does promote a little bit better healthy view of the markets with interest rates going up just a little bit on the back end of the curve, i.e. the uh, bond market. Um, if we come in here and look at currencies, uh, we look at the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is just a slow roll lower, you know, and I was telling you guys, you want to be uh, long euro dollar or short dollar if you've got the data. Uh, but you could see here, we're hitting my target down here, the initial target. Any uh, rally in the dollar should be sold. And then, of course, if we look at the euro, it's going to be the mirror image opposite. Uh, any dip should be bought. And we're near the, um, right here, you could see we're near the uh, the highs that were last made on uh, September the 18th, um, this past week for the euro. It uh, is regained being in the green, and that's kind of where we see it. My favorite trade, though, this year in the currency market is the yen. You can see how the yen just took off, and we got in on this way down over here. I was, and I gave you guys a freebie uh, for our weekend update, um, but I've been hammering it home with our members. A number of members took the trade, uh, made some really good money on They're still in the trade. Uh, some of them are, and um, I'm suggesting ways of how they can use some of our strategies to stay in the trade, wrapping their trade with options, right? Whether you're in the futures market or the uh, currency market. So that's a little bit about what I'm seeing in currencies. Now, of course, if we come to gold, gold is also very strong week. You can see here gold hit new um, all-time highs here on Friday, up 27.96% closing intraday at 2651 closed at 2647 so near the highs the um, there's almost no divergence in the macd's and you may be saying why is everybody buying gold well a lot of sovereign wealth funds russia china iran a lot of large banks are buying gold and i think a big part of that's because of the growing deficit that the u.s has our financial deficit and sooner or later it's going to wash back up on our shore and affect us not right now but it will and it's going to give us the mother of all bear markets and we're going to have a tough time of it i don't see that uh in the near term but i do believe over the next two to four years we're going to see something really ugly occur in the u.s financial markets not unless the politicians get a handle on this fiscal spending um and then, of course, if we come in here and look at now, look at gold. Just look at this chart left to right, straight up, right? I mean, just here we go, straight up. Now, look at the silver chart. Silver right here is, while it's moving higher, it hasn't made new highs since May 20th. We had this move lower, and then we're now trying to make it back up. Right now, the ratio of silver to gold is right, you know, roughly 110, 120 ounces of silver makes up one ounce of gold. It's very stretched. That's why I do like a pair trade where you go long silver, short gold. I think silver is going to eventually catch up. And you're not really trading one over the other. You're trading the relationship between the two. And they normally move in unison. The reason why we've got a wider spread than normal is because silver has an industrial component to it. Gold does not. So we're seeing that slowdown in PMIs. They've been just really getting ugly over the past year. So that does affect some of the silver component as well as batteries and EVs. Companies aren't shipping the amount of uh, EVs as they thought they would. They're cutting EV production. So that does affect a little bit of it, puts a little bit of downward pressure on silver. All right. But I do believe that this ratio is going to catch back up shortly. So it'd be a really interesting pair trade. Um, on the the um, uh, energy market, if we look at oil, oil is around the lows. It's coming off my lows. It came right down to my target a little bit late. I had my target it hitting around the middle to late August, but we hit it right around uh, the middle, early September. But we're coming back up. Any rally right now in gold, 
I mean, in oil, I think it's going to come back down again. We may do a double test, and I think it'll take off to the upside. But right now, no, there's just plenty of supply, not enough demand. And I've been saying with gold moving down like this, this is also a vote on the global economy, just like copper, right? Um, <clears throat> copper is also a global economy uh, industrial metal. And I think if we just pull up copper for a second, you're going to see here, um, it's just it kind of goes where China goes. Now, eventually, I think copper is going to be way back up over here and it's going to take out these highs again. Um, so but right now, I just think coppers, as long as China's in the doldrums, I would to me, energy is going to be neutral to slightly down. Same thing with copper. And then, of course, if we look at nat gas. You can see nat gas here, you know, had a nice little move this past week. Right. Um, but I do believe nat gas is probably going to on any dip with this move right here. I'd, I'd be a buyer of a dip, but I wouldn't chase nat gas up at this level. All right, everybody. That's a very quick, fast update. Members, we'll go through some more detail. I got some more stocks for you to take a look at some other interesting ideas uh, on playing long and or short, depending on where you want to see the markets. Um, I will see you this Sunday evening at our weekly market watch at 7 p.m. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. Uh, we're just doing very well this year. All right, everybody. Take care.